and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Season 7, Episode 20 of Horror Hill. As always, I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we've got a particularly vile double feature for you tonight. These two stories have been hand-picked to make you squirm. Last week, I mentioned how much I enjoy a despicable protagonist, and I'm doubling down on that sentiment this week. We'll begin with Mommy's Dearest by Paris Clark. Bethany is a young woman with a few problems. One is her young infant, Alex, who Bethany didn't exactly plan on. Another is an increasing addiction to heroin. This is a story with a few twists and turns, so I don't want to ruin it by telling you more. Suffice to say that this one ends up getting very ugly. Also, we have a special guest for this story. Melissa Medina will be joining me, who is playing two guest roles in this story. Following that, we'll conclude our evening with The Baseball by Taylor Anderson. This story could almost be seen as a picturesque encapsulation of traditional Americana, a man out for a walk with his loyal dog, reminiscing about his youth playing baseball. However, a story as straightforward as that would certainly never make it onto this program, so rest assured that things take a turn for the nightmarish. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast, bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Specifically, today's stories include particularly disturbing material related to infants, parenthood, drug use, and violence against animals. Listener discretion is highly advised. And before we get started with everything, I wanted to make sure that you, yes, you, listener, aren't missing out on all of the dastardly delights that we have to offer. Horror Hill is one of several shows created by Chilling Entertainment, and if you find yourself jonesing for more each week, you might want to check out some of our other programs. 
Our other shows include Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Drew Blood, Dark Tales, Fear from the Heartland, hosted by Paul J. McSorley, and Scary Stories Told in the Dark, hosted by Otis Cheery. You can find all of these on YouTube and the podcast platform of your choice, or you can get ad-free versions by subscribing at the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights website. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today and get instant access. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. And now, from author Paris Clark, I give you Mommy's Dearest. Bethany Briggs sped down Highway 145. Her hands were shaking, and although the air conditioner in her 96 Honda Civic was working fan-fucking-tastically and was blowing its ass off, it wasn't doing jack shit to stop her from sweating. At this point, the only thing that would fix her problem was something to tie off with and a syringe. She didn't care if it was dirty. As long as it removed the body aches, it was going right into a vein to be greeted with a praise Jesus hallelujah. Though she knew Jesus wouldn't approve, she also knew he wouldn't approve of a multi-million dollar church or complex. One paid for by the people who suckled at the teat and every word of some evangelical preacher who thought his shit smelt fan-fucking-tastic. Would Jesus even go to such a place? No. He would be where she was headed. He would be amongst the poor, broken and sick. He would be in hospitals, in strung-out communities, and most likely in a third-world country purifying shit water creating fish from rocks, or some other type of fan-fucking-tastic shit. He wouldn't be here, in some shanty town in the middle of bumfuck Arkansas, where the worst problems were meth or heroin addicts like herself. Her car's gas light had been on for more than ten miles. Knowing she was running on fumes, she should have pulled into the gas station she was now passing, but her cravings drove her somewhere else somewhere the sun didn't shine until you injected it. She didn't think she was going to have this problem. It had been 46 hours. She left town early Friday morning and spent that afternoon visiting family and attending her Uncle Jason's funeral the following Saturday. She didn't even like the perv. He always got too close to people, was touchy, and had a fetish for smelling the hair of every female he came close to. She had gone only because her mother begged her to come and let the family meet the baby. The baby was Alexander Martin Reyes, who was the caramel-skinned bundle of headaches sleeping in the car seat in the back passenger seat. She had argued with her mother that they wouldn't want to see him. Most of them are fucking racists, she had told her. They'll either ignore him and me or look at us distastefully. Her mother couldn't deny that, but there would still be family there that wouldn't. Her brother and sister, for instance, who had only seen him a few weeks after his birth. He was going to be 14 months old this October. Besides that, she knew she wouldn't be able to shoot up there, and sadly enough, that bothered her more than anything else. She had taken a handful of oxy to cure her cravings and keep her from having withdrawals, but she had eaten her last couple of pills after lunch on Saturday. She also hadn't slept last night, making this the 26th straight hour she had been awake. Her body was screaming for relief, and she felt a hint of it as she passed the big green metal sign reading Grapevine. Who the fuck came up with that name anyway? She thought. Nobody she knew ever grew grapes here, and there was never a winery, 
But there was a group of bootleggers hiding out in the woods by the creek behind Mr. Thompson's place. She didn't think that counted, though. She turned down 4th Street, sending a wave of anticipation coursing through her veins as they prepared to be pumped full of something else. Now all she had to do was yield at every stop sign, which was every block of this street, and wasn't that just fan-fucking-tastic. She hoped she wouldn't see the 5 She was in no condition to deal with their bullshit because it was obvious she was coming down, and that would only mean trouble for her, and for little Alexander, who was still snoozing away. Coming to the last stop sign, she barely slowed. It was 10.30 a.m., so most folks were still in church, getting their dose of Jesus, which meant less traffic while she raced to get hers. She passed a yellow dead-end sign as the asphalt turned to gravel, and pine trees replaced the string of houses. One hundred yards further, the trees gave way to an overgrown grassy field, and hidden in the middle was a new white double-wide. It was a nice place. Most people didn't suspect the occupants of being the sole drug dealers in town. That's why it's so nice, she thought. They have to keep up appearances, though the yard could use mowing. Two vehicles were in the driveway, a new black Cadillac Escalade and a white Chevy Impala. She parked in front of a small gray metal shed off to the side so she could leave if anybody else showed up. That was unlikely since it was a Sunday. Most came on Fridays after cashing their checks. The rest would trickle in during the first of the month after they sold off their food stamps or got their crazy checks. She would have left the car running, but she needed every drop of gas left in the tank. She wouldn't be gone long, and the dark gray clouds overhead looked like they were about to start sobbing at any moment. It felt nice enough outside, so it wouldn't hurt the little bugger to stay a few minutes by himself. She cracked all four windows and turned to check on Alexander. He was still sound asleep and wore nothing but a diaper. I'll be right back, she whispered to him and got out, slowly closing the door but making sure it shut. The last thing she needed was the cabin lights to stay on and run her battery down. She had texted a few hours earlier and given her ETA, so she didn't bother knocking on the front door. The living room was spotless. A brown leather L-shaped couch lined two of the walls. The coffee table before it bore two large crystal ashtrays. One held cigarette butts. The other held the tiny brown tips of smoked marijuana blunts. Along the opposite wall was a silver 42-inch plasma TV standing atop an entertainment center. There was a PS2 and an Xbox on the shelves below it. The walls were void of decoration, and dark curtains blocked most of the outside light from coming in. It was a straight-up bachelor pad, and come to think of it, she didn't know if anybody actually lived here. This was just their office building. She took a right heading down the hallway to the back room. There, her oasis awaited her with white and brown powders. This time, she did knock. Who is it? A muffled male's voice greeted her. It's BB. She heard him tell somebody else, Yo, unlock the door. The handle jiggled as the gatekeeper beyond the threshold relinquished its blockade to paradise. The door opened. Sup? She greeted a skinny, shirtless guy who ignored her and returned to the black swivel desk chair in front of the computer in the corner. He slid a pair of bulky headphones on and went back to shooting zombies. How was your trip? Anthony asked from the couch on the opposite side of the room. He was Hispanic and well kept, just like this trailer. He donned a fresh haircut name brand jeans, and a white t-shirt. A small gold chain hung from his neck, and small diamonds pierced his ears. All were undoubtedly real. He wasn't a user. He smoked a little pot once in a while, but that was it. He firmly believed in don't get high on your own supply, and don't mix business with pleasure. 
If she had to guess, he was pretty professional for a small town drug dealer. The woman in the light blue scrubs, Miss Margaret Delane, who lay passed out beside him, was not a believer in don't mix business with pleasure. If not for her, none of Anthony's clients would have had a reliable source of clean needles. Bethany wasn't sure if she was compensated with cash or drugs, but from what she was observing, it might have been a bit of both. She didn't have any evident track marks on her arms, so if she was a heavy user, then she was good at hiding it, just like herself. You want to know how my trip went? Fucking terrible, that's how. Those pills only lasted a day. I had to leave at five this morning because I was starting to have withdrawals. If you would have had more money, you would have had more pills. She pulled two folded $100 bills from the back pocket of her blue jean booty shorts. Not sure if you're allowed to call them such if the woman in question has no booty, but I digress. And slapped them down on the glass-topped coffee table in front of him. Need a fresh needle? and Give me whatever that's worth. No wait. Give me ten back. I need to get gas. He smiled. Muy buena, chica. He sat up and opened the large wooden box that sat on the table. So, who did you rob or screw? <sighs> Nobody. She said sharply and sat down beside him. My dad gave it to me. He always gives me money. Tells me to buy diapers or whatever I need. He pulled out a small baggie containing a white powder, a hand torch, and a bent spoon. Have one on the house. Looks like you need one, he urged her and took out a small bag of cotton balls, followed by an unopened syringe, which he handed to her directly. She knew she shouldn't. Alexander was in the car, and she needed to get home. He would be waking up soon and wanting something to eat or needing to be changed. Just a little bump, she thought. Just enough to ease these damn shakes. You sure you want this much? He asked her. I shouldn't, she thought. You don't need money for bills? Not as long as I keep getting child support from your cousin, she replied, keeping her eyes fixated on the white powder. Plus, you know, I live in one of those government housing apartments on Lincoln. I had food stamps on top of that, along with the cash they pay me at the restaurant for winning tables, and, you know, I'm all good. I really shouldn't, she thought. Can't believe you let that dumb fuck knock you up. People do stupid shit when they're high. She replied and then thought, Should I? Anthony was nodding as he sifted through the box. True that. Yeah, she thought and began to go through the motions, slowly and steadily to not spill anything. Once she had her concoction safely in her syringe, Anthony handed her an elastic band. She rejected it, slipped a foot out of one of her purple sandals, which she had bought from Wally World this past weekend, and leaned over. She normally injected into her groin because it was the least noticeable spot, but she didn't feel comfortable dropping her shorts here. Finding a vein was easy, and the relief was almost instant. It was like being transported into the sky by an angel, turning your entire body into a cloud. She sat the now empty syringe on the table and laid back. Fan fucking tastic. Off to La La Land she went. Coming back around, Bethany sat up. The bag of euphoria she ordered sat on the table next to the syringe she had used and a $20 bill. Anthony was gone, along with the wooden box. Margaret was gone as well. She felt good, though. Actually, she felt fan-fucking-tastic. Praise Jesus! Hallelujah! Amen, sister. She could hear two guys shouting from the living room. One was yelling, Run, you son of a bitch, run! The other yelled in defiance, No, 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 no! She gathered her stuff and headed out. Anthony and the skinny pale guy were on the couch playing Madden. She gave them a slight wave as she quickly headed out the door. The brightness of the sun made her flinch. Where the fuck did all the clouds go? She thought. 
It feels like a hundred fucking degrees out here. The white Impala was gone. She hadn't been in there that long, had she? She hurried to the back passenger door of her car. She had a bad feeling. Alexander wasn't crying. Maybe he was still asleep. She silently prayed to baby Jesus, teen Jesus, and adult Jesus that he was. Looking through the window, she saw no sweat on him. Maybe because she wasn't gone that long after all. But he did look lighter than usual. That's because it's so bright, she told herself. She opened the door and a wave of heat met her face. Turning his face towards her, she promptly stepped back and slammed the door closed. He had dead eyes. She began biting her nails and tapping her other hand against her thigh. She stared into the milky eyes as they stared back at her. This was not good. This was not fan-fucking-tastic. What had she done? But more importantly to her, what would she do now? She couldn't call the police, at least not out here. If she did, she would never be able to feed her hunger again, and she was damned if she was about to go through withdrawals again so soon. Fuck that. She could leave and go home and say she forgot about him. Then again, she thought that wouldn't work either. The cops would start asking questions, find out she was a junkie, and charge her with neglect and probably murder. She'd go to jail. She wouldn't have any way to feed her hunger that way, so withdrawals it would be. No, fuck that. But what if somebody took him? Stole him? Yeah, that could work. I, I don't know what happened, officer. She said to herself. He was there one moment and the next he was gone. I, I was asleep when somebody broke in and took him. But where's there? Come on, Bethany, get your shit together. Where could this have happened? It would need to be somewhere local, but there isn't shit around here. It could happen at the house. I would just have to open a window. There are no cameras around any of the apartments. So, yeah, this could work. But what the hell do I do with you? Bethany didn't know that detail yet, but she knew she needed to get out of there before one of them came out to see her looking like this. Getting in the car, she stuffed the drugs and syringe into her white faux leather purse sitting in the passenger seat, then turned the key she had left in the ignition. The radio showed 3.30. Hot air blew from the air vents. She rolled down all the windows, releasing the heat from the oven and the stench of Alexander's soiled diaper. What the fuck am I going to do with you? She thought. Coming to the end of the driveway, she stared at the back of the diamond-shaped dead-end sign. The road department worker who had erected the sign would never know just how right they were. What to do with you? She thought. The air was blowing cool now. Rolling up the windows, she put it in park and hid in the shade of the pine trees that rose above her. She had to figure out something before she left this place. She would prefer to bury him, but knew that was out of the question. She didn't have a shovel and wasn't going to go buy one or ask anybody for one. How would that look? Get a shovel and the next day my baby comes up missing? Fuck that. She had to dump him, but where? Dumpster? Woods? River? Dumpster. But in broad daylight? Couldn't be the river. There'd be too many people enjoying their last day of freedom. She smacked the palm of her hand into her forehead. Why did she think she had to dump him right away? It would be better to do it at night anyway. Then she could put him in the river, just like baby Moses. It would be suspicious if she came home and somebody saw her without him in the first place. If she did it between two and four in the morning, then most people would be asleep and none the wiser. That would work, she thought. Turning onto Lincoln Street, 
She drove past a man who was cheerfully walking down the sidewalk while wearing a green and orange suit. He went unnoticed. She focused more on the neighborhood kids, playing in water sprinklers and inflatable kiddie pools. Too bad Alex would never be able to experience such enjoyments. Their mothers, who were all wearing bikinis, were laid out on lawn chairs. Their tanning lotion-coated skin shined. They were surely gossiping about some poor soul. As for their current flings, they were gathered around four circular grills, drinking beer and, from the looks of it, talking shit to one another. The black metal bar fence surrounding the small apartments made her feel like she was entering a small prison camp. She wondered if that was how things would eventually end. Her, behind bars. She smiled and waved as she passed them. They mostly ignored her. That was good. Parking in her assigned spot in front of her two-bedroom red brick apartment, she quickly got out and went around to get out the body. She undid the car seat and wrapped it in the light blue blanket lying in the back seat. She could feel its stiffness as she picked it up. She didn't bother to get anything else. She had to hide this thing. She flicked the light on in its room. The walls were light blue. A white wooden crib was to one side, and a white dresser slash changing table was opposite. She sat it in its crib before going to the window and opening it. She didn't want the corpse stinking up her apartment and wouldn't change its diaper. She finished cleaning up after it. Thankfully, the window had a bug screen, because the last thing she wanted was a bunch of flies invading the room. It would have just been another mess she would have to clean up. She flicked the light back off as she left, ensuring to properly close the door and not leave it cracked like normal. There would be no need to try to hear when it woke. Returning to her car, she gathered the diaper bag and her purse. The neighbors were still minding their own business. There's a first time for everything, she thought. There are a lot of firsts happening today. Tossing the bag and purse on the coffee table, she crashed onto the futon in her living room and turned on the television. She laid on her back, looking up at the white drywall ceiling tiles and listening as a used car dealer gave his pitch. No credit? No problem! Come on down to Shelby's Motors, and with a few hundred bucks down, I'll have you driving off with your new car, truck, or SUV today. And that is a guarantee. Nothing is guaranteed, she thought. One would have guaranteed that any mother would cry if her child had died. But she hadn't. Nor did she want to. Sadly enough, she felt more relieved than anything. It was a burden lifted off her chest. She was free. Free at last. Fan-fucking-tastic. She sat up and went into her purse to find her fix. A tall, slender, blonde-haired demon wearing a green suit with orange pinstripes walked into a Little Rock abortion clinic. The appearance of the young, spiky, blue-haired woman behind the reception desk freaked him out a little. Both of her eyebrows were pierced, a nostril, and multiple places on both her ears and each side of her bottom lip. She wore all black, including her lipstick and eyeliner. Walking up to the counter, he gave her a big smile, showing his perfectly straight white teeth. She looked up, rolled her eyes, and sighed. Lucutio, what do you want? He looked around the room to make sure the two ladies waiting to have the life sucked out of their bellies weren't trying to eavesdrop, and asked, Where's that little demon that runs around with you? You mean my son? He's not your son. And you're not a blonde-haired, green-eyed, goofy-ass-looking weirdo either. She said, mocking his appearance. We have to blend in. Well, I guess you make a good point. But I must reject your analysis and say I don't look goofy, but rather fly. 
Dashing, one could say. He straightened his sport jacket. At least I'm not the one with metal all in my face. How's it feel getting too close to a magnet, Mrs. Pinhead? This is modern anti-establishment fashion. Get with the times, old man. Anti-establishment? Ha! Locutio blurted. The two girls looked up from their magazines. Locutio raised a hand and twinkled his fingers at them as he smiled. Hi, how are you? Good? That's good. He gave them a thumbs up. My sister here is a little cray-cray, he told them, and then whistled while making a circular motion with his index finger next to his head. Returning his attention to his fellow demon, he said, Must I remind you, you're not human. Never have been. Never will be. So what establishment are you exactly against? She pointed a finger up. Your entire existence is a rebellion against that. You know this, so this modern fashion mumbo-jumbo stuff is making you look ridiculous. How about we just agree to disagree because I'm not about to spend till Judgment Day arguing with you over each other's fashion choices. Good deal, Lucille. Now, where is that little thing? She turned her head and called out, Billy, your uncle's here to take you to your appointment! Then said to Lucutio, Just take it and leave before you get on my nerves even more. Tiny footsteps began paddling down the hall behind Lucille. A moment later, a male toddler wearing a black John Deere shirt and jeans appeared running down the hall. Unk! 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 The little beast chanted as it raced to the door leading to the waiting room. There was a hard thump against the door, followed by a small groan. There was a moment of stillness before it swiftly swung open, setting loose the charging beast who ran to Lucutio's side and wrapped its little arms around his legs, giving him a heart-wrenching little hug. Lucutio patted him atop his head. The beast raised its arms. Up, 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 it demanded. He reluctantly obliged. Lucille was smiling. This is not funny, Lucutio snapped at her. I think you would make a great dad, Lucille responded. If you mean great, as in raising a bunch of murderous savages, then of course I would, he assured her. But it doesn't mean that I want to. What does that have to do with anything anyways? This thing is just as old as we are. Go! 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 The little beast demanded. I don't have to bring it back, do I? Lucutio asked. Lucille shook her head. It'll come back on its own. Good deal, Lucille, he replied and turned to leave. Wave bye-bye to mommy. Bye, 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 bye! It repeated as it wiggled a tiny hand at Lucille. Exiting the building, Locutio headed around back, where his disappearing act would be less noticeable. You ready to do some work, little guy? The demon in his arms nodded and gave him a wide smile, revealing dozens of small pointed teeth. Oh dear Lord Satan, don't do that so close to my face. Shut your lips and close them back up. Good. Good job there, kiddo. Coming to the back of the building, Lucutio did a quick 360 to look for pedestrians. Not seeing a single human, he disappeared. Reappearing behind Bethany's apartment, Lucutio poked a finger through the bug screen and pulled it from the dead baby's bedroom window. There you go, little fella, he told the demon as it crawled through the window. It tumbled over the edge and landed with a hard thump on the carpet. You okay? Uh-huh, the demon responded and walked to the crib. Quick question, if I do beg your pardon, little fella, but, um, 
Would you mind if I stuck around and watched? I do love a good show every now and again. The demon's childish face lit with excitement as it showed its pointed teeth and an unusually wide smile while giving Locutio a hefty amount of nods. Oh, goody. Now, stop smiling at me. The little demon began to climb into the crib. If only I had some popcorn. But I don't even know if I like popcorn. I do know I don't like sour Skittles, but I remember eating some chocolate a few decades ago, and it was awfully tasty. The demon pulled the blanket from the body, then removed its soiled diaper, throwing both to the floor. It opened its mouth. Slowly, it began to stretch until it was large enough to accommodate the baby's size. The demon began pulling the corpse feet first into its mouth. Once its legs were in, it lifted the stiff body vertically and began slowly scarfing it down in loud gulps. Oh, dear Satan. I think I've just lost my appetite. The demon began to twitch violently as it closed its mouth around the corpse's head. It started to shrink causing its clothes to fall off. Its blonde hair grew shorter and turned black. Its pale skin grew darker as it gradually turned into the baby it had just consumed. Now isn't that a neat trick, Lucutio stated. The baby turned and smiled, its teeth now human-like. It then lay down and began to let out piercing cries. Lucutio rubbed his hands together. I do believe it's showtime. Thirty minutes later. Lucutio stood with his head lying on his arms, which were folded on the windowsill. I thought you were good at this, he questioned. The demon ceased screaming, stood, and flipped him the bird with both of its tiny hands. Jumping through the window, Lucutio told it, I'm going to see what's going on. The baby demon raised its arms. Oh, dear Satan, Lucutio exclaimed and picked up the naked demon. Opening the door, Lucutio could hear the television. Janice Storm was telling them how hot it would be during the coming week. He slowly crept down the hall and peeked his head around the corner to see Bethany in her white bra and panties lying back on the black futon. I think she's dead, he told the demon in his arms. He walked over to her and saw the syringe sticking out of her inner thigh near her groin. He raised a hand and slapped her hard across the face. Wake up! It had no effect. He wrapped a hand around her neck. Well, she has a pulse. I guess we're just going to have to wait until she wakes up, he told the little demon as he sat it down on the couch next to her. He grabbed the remote from the coffee table and handed it over. Find something good to watch. I'm going to see if she has any popcorn. Bethany slowly began to come around, ignoring what she thought was a person running from the room and chalking it up to a dope-induced hallucination, she sat up and pricked the syringe from her groin. It was now dark outside. She grabbed the remote from the coffee table and pressed the info button, 9.47pm. The TV was on channel 122 and Fred Krueger was giving someone their final nightmare. She set the remote aside and hesitated when she noticed the bowl of half-eaten popcorn lying with most of its contents spilled out beside her. She hadn't made any popcorn. If she didn't, then who? Her eyes jerked to the hallway as a baby screamed. Not possible, she thought. She stood her legs a little wobbly, and cautiously headed towards the sound. 
Coming to the door, she took a few deep breaths to calm the nerves that were trying to take away her high. The sound was unmistakable. It was definitely a crying baby. She thought this couldn't be possible again, but this was no hallucination. Was it possible one of her neighbors found him and was pulling some sick prank? Who in their right mind would do such a thing? Then again, who in their right mind would plan to dispose of their own baby's corpse so they wouldn't have to face the consequences of being a junkie? Even worse, who in their right mind would be relieved that their child was dead so they no longer had to deal with shitty diapers, vomit, and 18 more years of responsibilities? But what if somebody had found him? What would she say? That her air conditioner had malfunctioned and she left the window open so he could get air? That she thought he would be okay for a few hours while he took his nap? That she knew he had died, but while in a panic, she brought him home and didn't know what to do because she was too consumed with grief? She could blame Sid's. In any case, she would need to cry, but she knew that wouldn't happen. She began vigorously rubbing at her eyes to redden them. Once they were burning, she reached for the door. The knob disappeared in her hand along with the rest of her house. She was in absolute darkness. The air suddenly turned hot and humid. The carpet on her bare feet grew softer and wet. The baby's cries seemed further away now. From above, a white glow began illuminating her surroundings. It was a full moon, and she was standing in a forest. The dew dampened green leaves of the ferns and the furs of the moss coating everything glistened in the moonlight. It wasn't cold, but she exhaled and still emitted a slight fog. Through the trees, she could faintly see the white crib she had placed the corpse in. Was this Judgment Day? Had she overdosed and was now paying the piper? God. Please forgive me for all my sins, she thought repeatedly as she made her way through the brush. Standing beside the crib, she looked down at her son, who was now laughing. His pudgy legs kicked, and his arms were raised, showing he wanted her to hold him. Was this some kind of test? A way to show that subconsciously she was a loving and caring mother? Was this supposed to trigger some kind of heartwarming response from her? She wanted to feel that so bad, but was feeling the exact opposite. She had been free, and now all she could feel were the shackles of motherhood being clamped back around her ankles and wrists. That was not going to happen. She thought the last time had been an accident, but this time... It was just going to be murder. She picked him up and gave him a goodbye embrace. He wrapped his tiny arms around her neck and squeezed her. She held her eyes shut. Something strange was happening. She had never felt like this before. There was a warmth in her chest and a weakening in her limbs. Was this what real love felt like? Unaware that the baby she was now embracing was slowly transforming, she tightened her hold around him and began to sob. Its tiny fingernails fell off and gave way to black claws. The rounded tops of its ears grew pointed, and its tiny mouth expanded fourfold to reveal dozens of razor-sharp teeth. I'm so sorry. Bethany cried. The demon reared its head back and gave her a wide smile. Oh my god! She screamed and tried to pull the demon off her. The demon quickly sank its teeth into the side of her neck and began thrashing its head like a shark. A torrent of blood began to flow down her half-naked body. She let out one last scream before the demon swallowed what flesh he had and then chomped down on her windpipe leaving her gurgling as blood filled her lungs. 
She fell to her knees as crimson flowed over her breasts. The next chomp severed her spinal cord and soul, causing her to topple over. The final bite took what little flesh held her head to her torso. Lucutio, who had been peering around one of the trees, stepped out and began applauding. Bravo, bravo, he cheered. The demon stood, fully covered in blood, bowed, and then picked up his prize by its hair and held it high as it smiled in triumph. Now, stop smiling, Lucutio told it. You're giving me the creeps. You've been listening to Mommy's Dearest by Paris Clark. Paris Clark is an author from a small town in Arkansas. His love for stories and all things fascinatingly weird and disturbing has inspired him to create universes where his characters can come to life. Having no literary degree, his vivid imagination and the compulsion to rid his thoughts of his ideas has enabled him to create stories that we can all enjoy. And now, for our final story of the evening, I present The Baseball by Taylor Anderson. It was a humid evening as Peter Green made his way through the small park on the edge of his property. He walked at a steady pace, just slightly behind his wife's Labrador retriever, Lex, who was tugging frantically on the leash, needing to relieve himself on every tree that lined the shaded path. He pulled in the way that children do, trying to slip the grasp of an angry parent with vigor, determination, and with no chance of actually freeing himself. Peter breathed an exasperated exhale as he walked away from his wife and the argument that had just erupted, smirking an egotistical half-smile and shaking his head lightly. Peter, who was used to this daily routine, couldn't help but scoff at the dog. How minuscule his brain must be to never gain any inclination that he would never be able to break the leash. The dog would pull until he was gasping, choking, and coughing, but never ceased. The two would play a never-ending game that always ended with Peter giving a hard yank on the dog's neck, Lex jerking back with a sharp cry, and Peter shoving a stiff knee into his hind legs. From that point, the dog would walk sheepishly, glancing back every few seconds with a lowered head. Their walks usually lasted around 10 to 15 minutes, just long enough for Lex to do his business and Peter to get back to his. They took the same route every evening. It was predictable and quick, which is how Peter liked it. He was a man of routine who enjoyed the monotony of the daily grind and climbed into his recliner at the end of a workday with an old-fashioned bitter resentment for the world. Life had not panned out the way it was supposed to for him and it seeped out of every pore. The park was littered with trash, an obvious sign of the changing times. Peter noticed a piece of paper rustling in the breeze at the end of the paved pathway. He expected to find an amount of trash from the overflowing garbage can next to the sidewalk. The pampered youth have no respect anymore, he thought. As he neared the end of the path and approached the parking lot at the top of the park, he noticed a pale green bill lying naked on the blacktop. His face dropped as the wind carried the $50 bill off toward the corner of the parking lot. Peter took off after the bill, and it was as if the pair's roles were reversed for the first time. Lex moved his legs quickly to keep from being dragged along the pavement by his owner. The two moved swiftly across the parking lot. As they reached the end of the lot, merely feet from the prize, the bill halted at the fence to the old baseball field and, with one last gust of wind, was pushed through the crack near the gate and carried toward home plate. God damn it! 
Peter seethed. Just my damned luck, he thought to himself as he kicked at the bottom of the fence. Some kids, rolling past on skateboards, who had watched the older gentleman fail at catching the bill, shouted, Better luck next time, old man! They laughed to themselves mockingly and moved along. An exhausted Lex, huffing and panting in the summer heat, laid his body down at the bottom of his master's feet. In an embarrassed rage, Peter pushed the dog roughly away. He noticed a slight separation in the gated fence and decided he wouldn't be bested today. He pushed his head through the tight space and then moved his upper body through with an enormous inhale, his legs following closely behind. Come on, he ordered sternly while still holding the leash. Lex bowed his head low and gave a small whimper of reluctance. Now, he squawked as he gave Lex's leash a hard yank toward the gate. Lex yelped at the sharp pain around his neck as he scampered obediently onto the ball field. The pair stopped to observe the field for a moment, scanning the grass for any signs of the cash prize. The area was overgrown and brown, as if it had been forgotten years prior. The sun's golden rays washed over the field, giving it an almost sepia tone. It was the golden hour of the evening, providing a picturesque lighting that would soon be followed by the cover of night. A light breeze pushed out a smell of mulch and leaves from the woods that lined the outskirts of the field. The bill was nowhere in sight. Frustrated, Peter exhaled an exhausted sigh, closed his eyes, and reveled in the nostalgia. He was suddenly eleven years old again. It was the summer of 77. He and his friends would ride their bikes over town, blowing their small allowances on candy and baseball cards and occasionally sneaking into the community pool to cool from the summer's harsh rays. The pool staff knew that they crept in, but there was an understanding in the community between the haves and the have-nots, and it was in nobody's interest to remove children from the small enjoyment of summer. Peter's father was a blue-collar worker, and his mother was a seamstress who worked out of their home. His parents worked hard to provide the little they could for their children. Though the family struggled, the children always got their two-dollar-a-week allowance as long as they completed their chore list. Peter's parents thought it was very important to teach their children how to manage money at a young age, work for what they have, and take pride in it. With a low exhale, Peter was brought back to the present. He gazed down at his hand and twisted around the ring on his pinky finger. It was his championship ring from high school, from when his baseball team had won the state championship. Times sure had changed. He thought of his family back at home. His wife was not making dinner, but ordering pizza to be delivered while she scanned social media. His children were not doing chores or studying, but upstairs playing video games on a console his wife had bought them recently just because. She didn't discuss it with him beforehand. This was how their marriage went. The family unit had disintegrated since he was a boy, or so he had witnessed in his own life. His wife never respected him enough to value his opinion on finances. His parents would sit down once a week to talk over finances and see what they could and could not afford that week. The only thing he and his wife did together every week, besides arguing, was watch a television show on Thursday nights. His parents had the kind of marriage he had hoped to have in his adult life, but couldn't seem to manage. The truth that resonated in his mind was that Peter was a pushover. When he and his wife met at 19, he thought she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He gave her everything he had, time, money, and love. He desired the life he had witnessed growing up. He wanted to be the strong man his father had always been, but his wife had been the strong, assertive one in the family, 
He was never the provider he had wanted to be. He was left a bitter, aging man who was powerless in his own home, and poor Lex took the brunt of that anger. Peter began walking around the field, starting at the gate he entered on the side of the right field. He and Lex walked across the center field, the dog still worn out and panting slightly. The dry grass crunched under their feet in the summer heat as they made their way around the field's perimeter. They walked firmly, as if they were the keepers of the field, guarding against unwelcome trespassers. They moved along the field in an eerie silence. There were no sounds of vehicles or children running in the adjacent park. The wind didn't even seem to be moving. It was still, almost as if time had stopped. Lex stopped on the leash without warning and let out a low growl. It started faintly at first, but then it started to get louder. Peter stopped when he felt the jerk of the motionless dog at the end of the leash. It was at that moment that he heard a laugh. A low, slow cackle sent a chill up his spine. He turned his head from side to side, trying to determine where the laugh was coming from. Was it a laugh at all? The wind seemed to pick back up and change directions every few seconds. It became impossible for Peter to determine where the sound was coming from. Just as he turned toward the woods, the wind died down. The sound was gone as quickly as it had begun. Strange, Peter thought to himself. He assured himself that he had just been hearing the whispers of the wind. It was the distorted sounds of kids playing in the distance somewhere. Peter and Lex strolled across the left field and made a left at the fence, continuing toward third base. In the distance, Peter noticed a round, white object lying on the home plate, but no bill in sight. The pair strode over the third base as Lex started to slow down. He was walking at almost a snail's pace until about 20 feet from home plate. At that point, he was unwilling to walk any further. He let out a low growl from the back of his throat as the hair stood, almost one by one, on his back and neck. He lowered his head toward the ground and kept his eyes glaring ahead. Peter pulled the dog once, but Lex refused to move this time. Peter attempted again with his signature hard yank on the dog's neck, which always worked, but the dog remained still. Lex stood like a statue, making no movement except his throat muscles flexing every few seconds. He continued to let out low, guttural, drawn-out growls toward the invisible demons he seemed to be battling ahead of him. Peter grabbed the scruff of the dog's neck firmly in an attempt to pull him along. As soon as he grasped the dog's fur, Lex snapped his head around and snapped his teeth at Peter's calloused hand. The dog did not connect with the skin, rather his top teeth clacked against the sharp teeth of his bottom jaw. It was not an attack, it was a warning to his master. Peter drew his hand back with a stunned expression on his face. Lex had never snapped at anyone before. Peter's astonishment turned to anger, and he raised his hand up over his head, rearing his arm back so far that his shoulder blades were almost meeting in the middle. Without hesitation, his ego guided his hand down toward the Labrador. He brought his closed fist down onto the dog's head with such force that when he made contact, Lex's front legs gave out, and he fell to the ground. Lex let out a yelp as his body crashed into the greenery. He lay still, his eyes still directed ahead. There was an eerie silence that crept over the both of them. It was the kind of silence that sat still and lingered. It was morose and deafening. The silence was cracked as Lex let out another growl, facing ahead. Peter was over it. He dropped the leash. The dog would eventually follow him, and if he didn't, Peter would be far from broken up about it. One less mouth to feed, 
Peter spat to himself as he walked over to the home plate to examine the rounded object that lay there. It was a baseball. Peter picked up the ball in his hand and ran his finger over the red stitching of the leather. The ball was beat up and frayed, the white now a dull beige. The cuts in the ball ran like canyons across the canvas. As he turned the ball over in his hand, he noticed an indentation in the leather. The number 13 jumped out at him. It seemed to have been scratched deeply into the ball with a familiar brownish hue to it. Peter ran his fingers over the number as if they were braille and his only way of fully understanding the characters. He let his eyes linger on the ball. A chill ran up his spine, onto the back of his neck, and into every follicle on his scalp. Every piece of hair felt like it was standing on end, almost stinging as if to remind him to breathe. He exhaled a long, deep gust of air, still looking at the ball perplexedly. Lucky number 13, Peter said out loud to himself. He was shaken out of his trance by an aggressive bark from his companion lying nearby. It was unlike any noise he had ever heard from the dog in the decade they had been together. This was not a warning as the other growls had been. This was something much, much different. As Peter lifted his head to look at Lex and yelled at him to shut his mouth, he turned his head toward the pitcher's mound just in time to catch a flash of a baseball as it careened into his right cheek below his eye. Peter let out a painful scream and clutched his face as he fell to the ground. He felt his cheek had swollen upon impact with the ball and could not clearly see out of his right eye. He touched his cheek and found that it felt almost like a sponge, as if the ball had disintegrated any bone that had once been there. The pain left him crumpled to the ground as he let out another painful yell, this time filled with anger. He turned his head toward the mound and saw a blurry image of what looked to be a man standing there. Peter could make out that the figure was a man, his head positioned just in front of the sun, causing him to look like a featureless silhouette. As his eyes adjusted, Peter started to make out the man's appearance. He was tall. He must have been seven feet tall. He had long, stringy black hair and looked just between thin and emaciated. His eyes looked black and were enhanced by the dark circles under them. His skin was pale, except for the skin around his mouth. A light brown traced along the outside of his lips, like a child who had been drinking Kool-Aid all day. He was dressed in all black, his clothing torn and frayed on the sleeves. He wore black boots that looked like a mix of cowboy and combat boots. His loose-fitting tie around his neck was black with dark green stripes providing the only hint of color that illuminated his dark presence. The man stood there, slightly hunched over, chin down, his eyes piercing upward directly into Peter's. He had the stance of a pitcher, looking to his catcher for the call. He had a devious smile, his teeth coated in brown stains. He smiled as Peter stared him down in anger. The man on the mound watched as the other man's face turned from anger to fear. This was what he came for. Watching their faces overturn as they came to terms with the very real danger they were in, he watched the light drain from Peter's eyes with a calm delight. As Peter opened his mouth to scream, the man rushed him from the mound, the smile still on his face. The way he covered the ground between them, it was almost as if his legs were six feet long. He seemed to get to Peter in as little as three strides. As Peter flipped to his back to defend himself, he saw the man more clearly. His face looked almost animated and inhuman. Peter's hands shot out in front of him instinctively to protect his face as the man jumped on top of him. 
He straddled him, grabbed both of Peter's wrists with one of his enormous hands, and pinned his arms above his head. He was extremely thin, but he sat like a boulder on top of Peter's abdomen. He was impossibly heavy for his appearance. He smiled and peered down at a helpless Peter kicking his legs beneath him. About twenty feet away, Lex had stopped barking and lay with his head on the ground, gazing curiously at the scene that was unfolding. Get off! Help! Get the fuck off me! Peter screamed as the man continued to gaze down at him. Peter tried to move his arms, to no avail. He noticed the man's teeth were rough, thin, jagged, and impossibly everywhere. They looked like rusted nails stuck haphazardly into different parts of his gums. Something was very wrong. He must have had over a hundred teeth in his mouth, if you could call them that. They were all jutting out in different directions, like an oral wood chipper. What do you want? Peter cried out. The man gazed down at Peter below him and smiled his jagged teeth at him. He leaned down very slowly, closer to Peter's face, until he was almost nose to nose with him. His noxious breath enveloped Peter, and as small traces of drool started to drip from the corners of his mouth, the man stated firmly, Better. In an instant, the man grabbed the baseball lying next to them in his oversized palm and brought the ball down onto the front of Peter's forehead in a windmill motion. There was no crunching noise, as one might come to expect with the cracking and caving in of a skull. Instead, it sounded almost like the dropping of an orange onto the floor. It was a low, muffled sound, followed by Peter's small gurgle and groan. The man reared back and hit him with the ball again, and again, and again. The blows became wild and animalistic as the man repeatedly started pounding the ball into the same spot on Peter's forehead as wheezes and gasps escaped the broken man's body. The figure let out a series of guttural grunts every time he made contact with the lifeless man below him. The grunts turned to laughs, and in a short time, the man was laughing hysterically as his brutality continued. Blood and bits of bone now coated the man's hand and ball. As quickly as the beating had begun, the man stopped swinging his fist. He sat still on top of the now faceless body, peering down at the crater he had created. He exhaled and released the ball to the ground. It rolled slowly away with small splatters of deepening red staining the surface. The man's hand had been so large that the baseball remained mostly untainted, having been enclosed almost entirely in his palm. The man snapped his head down quickly, about six inches from where his victim's face used to be, and forced out a hard, maniacal laugh. It was as if he was trying to laugh and scream simultaneously. He wanted his victim, even in death, to know just how much he had enjoyed himself. The madman rolled off of the body and continued rolling another few feet until he was lying on his back next to the baseball. He reached into his mouth with two of his gangly fingers and pinched the end of one of his teeth. He gave a firm twist and pulled as a tooth slid out of his gums, an iceberg in its own right. Two-thirds of his tooth had been hiding below his red gums. The tooth in his hand was now about five inches long. He grabbed the ball next to him and fondled it lightly in his hand. He sat up and moved on his knees toward the body nearby. He moved his hand toward the pulpy mess he had created and coated the end of the tooth in the crimson liquid now covering the surface of the home plate. The blood-drenched tooth met the soft white leather of the baseball. He moved the tooth strategically over the surface of the ball. He dipped the tooth in the blood one more time 
and continued his work with precision. When he was finished, he held the ball in front of his face and observed, 14. The man was stirred by an uncharacteristically strong exhale from Lex, who was still lying idly by. The man smiled, and without hesitation, he snapped his teeth around the right forearm of the lifeless body. Blood instantly coated the man's lips and mouth. He began tearing into the flesh, biting until he hit the bone. He easily snapped through the bone with one hard clench of his jaw. He shook his head from side to side until the hand no longer belonged to Peter. He picked up the detached hand and slipped the wrist into his jacket sleeve, the way that kids do with props on Halloween just before they shake hands with the unsuspecting grandparents. He walked over to Lex, who was now standing at attention, his hair back on end. His head was lowered, but his low growl was much more muffled than it had been before. The man reached toward the dog with a hand that had caused him pain not more than ten minutes ago. Lex snapped his teeth into the hand and started to shake it. The man let go of the hand and smiled. Lex shook the hand back and forth with a growl. He looked up at the man again and then ran toward the gate he had entered through, hand still in his mouth. The dog stopped just before exiting the field, looked back toward the man, and then disappeared. The man folded his hands in front of him as he watched the dog scamper off, a calm smile plastered on his face. He turned and walked back toward home plate. He bent down, grabbed one of the legs, started dragging the body behind him, and headed off toward center field. He tossed the ball up and down in his other hand. He whistled a nursery rhyme-like tune that floated over the dimming field, providing a sense of closure to this expiring summer's day. He dragged the body all the way to the fence in the center field. He turned back toward the field, reared his arm back, and threw the ball as far as he could toward the infield. The ball rolled to a stop, the blood now drying and changing from a deep red to an unappealing brown. The man lifted the body over his shoulder with ease as he climbed over the fence and strode into the woods, still whistling the melodic tune. Back at Peter's home, Holly Green looked at the clock on her phone. 8.31 p.m. This was about the time of night when Lex would be curled up on the floor next to her recliner, ready to go to bed but not quite ready to go alone. He had the same routine every night. He was as predictable as her husband. As she silently laughed in her head at this observation, she realized that they had been gone for over an hour on their walk. I'm probably still being a baby about it, she thought as she recalled their argument earlier in the evening. Holly got up and looked out the window at the park across the street. It was around dusk. The streetlights had just turned on in the park. They gleamed down on the cement path, not providing much assistance, as the walkway was still mostly visible in the quickly diminishing sunlight. They seemed to be more of a beacon, advising the wandering youth that darkness was rapidly approaching and it was about time to head home. She stood, looking out the window with her arms folded over her chest for almost ten minutes. She wasn't really looking at anything in particular, just watching the evening turn to darkness. She gently rubbed her arms as a chill from the AC washed over her. Holly made her way toward the back door. As she walked out the doorframe and into the backyard, she felt the warmth of the summer air hit her skin. Fireflies were illuminating the grass-covered yard, floating about like the ashes of a campfire, seemingly aimless and without purpose. She inhaled deeply and took in her garden's smell that lined the garage's walkway. It felt like the quintessential summer evening. Holly was suddenly shaken by the slight jingle of the chain-link fence that sat adjacent to the garage at the end of the yard. She squinted her eyes to take a look, but could not make anything out in the darkness. 
The jingle came again, but still she could not see anything in the blanket of black stretched out toward the end of the property. She walked back to the door she had just come through, reached inside, and flipped the switch to the floodlights overhead. The yard and garage were instantly bathed in light. The chain-link gate rattled again as Holly turned her attention to the sound. She strained her eyes to make out the source of the clanging metal. She saw, through the links in the fence, her dog lying down, his back turned to her. Lex! She hollered, feeling confused. He didn't move. She started off down the sidewalk path, the smell of her lavender again washing over her nostrils. As she got closer to the gate, she noticed that Lex's leash was still attached to his collar. Mrs. Green opened the gate, something she had done countless times before while greeting her dog returning from his evening walk. She was his human of choice, and he would, without fail, pummel her with licks and nips whenever he was reacquainted with her. This evening, though, Lex did not turn to greet her. She picked up the end of the leash and gave a slight tug. Come on, sweetheart, she cooed. He snapped his head around as if he was startled to see her there. He wagged his tail and just gazed upon her for a moment before turning away and bowing his head back toward the grass. Lex, you're filthy, she stated, noticing the discoloration that covered his snout and chest. Come on, she pleaded as she pulled again on the leash. Lex bent his head down again and turned to walk into the yard. It took a few moments for Holly to register what she was seeing before her heart almost leapt out of her chest. What the fuck? She thought as her head raced. She threw the gate open and ran into the alley behind the garage. Peter! She yelled as if calling a child home for supper. Peter! She screamed again, this time with more panic settling into her voice. She dipped her hand into her back pocket and grabbed her phone as she immediately dialed 911. What's going on, Mom? came a voice from the back door as her eldest son breezed into the backyard. Holly's face dropped. Go back inside, Troy, she urged as she started back toward the house. Troy looked at her with concern and confusion. Come on, boy. Troy insisted as he called to Lex, who was about halfway across the yard from him at that point. No, just go inside! Holly screamed as she took off running toward the dog. What's going on? Troy trailed off as he glanced down at the severed hand in the dog's mouth. It took him a moment to register what he was seeing, and a moment longer to register the very distinguishable ring on the pinky. He threw up reactively into his mother's beloved garden of tulips. You've been listening to The Baseball by Taylor Anderson. Well, folks, that concludes our program this evening, but don't worry, I'll be back next week for more chilling tales to keep you shivering in your boots. Also, I wanted to let you know that I and the rest of the Horror Hill team are cooking up some fun things for the rest of the year. We'll have more info soon, but until then, listeners, Stay spooky. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. 
where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.